Hey, You're Surge back. community. Amanda Chaco here. Thanks for joining us for another Surge Facebook premiere party. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Ryan Vaughn. Ryan Vaughn is the co-founder of VNN Sports. I met Ryan back in 2010 when he pitched his idea for VNN to the Momentum Accelerator program. Fast forward 10 years, and VNN is partnered with over 2,500 high schools across the United States. Ryan has recently left VNN and is exploring his next opportunity. Today, Ryan is gonna share his entrepreneurial journey and some of the insights he has made about himself along the way. Please welcome Ryan Juan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Amanda. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm excited. Yeah, so am I. So, Ryan, why don't you uh, just take us back, um, you know, pr even prior to the launch of VNN and tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your, walk us through that entrepreneurial journey um, with VNN. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I started creating things when I was really little. Um, my first business, I think I was in fourth grade and I would sell pogs, uh, those little, the things that used to flip the little circles. Um, I would sell those to kids on the playground. And that was actually probably the most profitable business I've ever run because all of the supply was free. Uh, my mom would just buy me pogs and then I'd sell those. And sometimes I'd even gamble them back and slam them and, and take the pogs back. So, <laughs> you know, dubious in terms of its legality, but, uh, but that was in fourth grade. Um, you know, I, I would always sort of go off the beaten path a little bit when others were taking tests, I would be designing board games, uh, or I wrote the school play for, uh, the elementary school, just all sorts of interesting stuff. Wow. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, I, I, uh, when I got out of college, is when I, uh, I sort of waited tables for a couple of years trying to figure out what I, what I wanted to do. And uh, when I was 22, uh, I decided to kind of take my first stab at creating something uh, as an adult and, uh, and in the business world. And my first stab was a company where it started out as a blog called Detroit Sport Report. And it failed really quickly. Uh, I found out that nobody wanted to hear what I had to say about the Lions and the Pistons. And so I had this car tattoo said Detroit Sport Report on my back windshield. And um, my now wife, then girlfriend, Laura, just gave me all sorts of crap for getting that tattoo. She thought it was the ugliest thing ever. But, uh, but I was stuck with it after that died, after that business died. And I just kept it for, you know, old time's sake. Uh, but from there, went into uh, the high school sports world and started a blog called West Michigan All-Star, which actually got some, some traction. Um, and then, you know, that was probably brings us up to around 2010. Um, and in 2010, I had this idea for what would eventually become BNN. Um, and it was a, it was my bajillion dollar idea. I was so excited about it that I would just, I couldn't tell anybody because somebody's going to steal it. <laughs> um, and, and I found myself on, uh, Ford field, uh, watching the high school football playoffs as part of West Michigan all-star. And as I'm on the 50 yard line, uh, taking pictures while the game's going on and this guy comes up to me and I knew him kind of casually, you know, through the high school sports scene, his name was Matt Anderson. And he comes up to me and he's like, Hey Ryan, I have this idea I wanted to talk to you about. And then he pitches me the idea for VNN that I was keeping secret and not telling anybody. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so um, I figured it was Providence or, or fate or something. And so we you know, joined forces. His skill set was complimentary to mine. And, um, and we decided to, to take a run at building it. Um, we went through, in 2010, we went through the Momentum uh, Accelerator, which is where we met. Yeah. Um, and uh, my background, my, uh, um, my degree was in creative writing, which means I got very little in the way of business training. So momentum was really my, my business school. Um, and I'm sure I learned an awful lot through momentum, but I think the one thing that sticks with me, uh, to today is we were at this dinner and, um, we had a speaker that was talking to us and we were all these entrepreneurs trying to get started. And, 
somebody asked the speaker, like, what's the one thing that you would want to leave these entrepreneurs with if, if there was just one lesson? And the guy gets sort of quiet and he's like, I've worked with professional sports teams. I've worked with small startups. I've worked with Fortune 100 companies. And the one thing that they all have in common is that nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Yeah. And the difference between the successful ones and non-successful ones are, the, are uh, you can't tell with the ones that make it work, which was super validating for uh, you know an entrepreneur that really didn't know what he was doing uh, at that stage. So um, yeah, huge, huge uh, 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 learning through that whole process. In 2012, we um, closed our first round of financing. Uh, so it took two years of PB and J and, you know, uh, sleeping on couches sometimes and all sorts of sacrifices to finally get to that point. But after that point, you know, we, uh, made our first hires and then quickly scaled from, you know, two guys in 2012 to up to, I think a peak of close to a hundred wow. in uh, 2016, 17. Um, and we've just, you know, the, the company has been cranking. Um, they provide a platform for high school athletic departments to communicate with all of their constituencies um, offsite. So then in an entirely digital platform, keeping parents and student athletes all on the same page, which is especially important now, given everything that's going on. And, you know, we made some good moves, a whole lot of bad moves, but overall we, uh, we were able to craft a leadership position and now the company is the, the um, worldwide leader in high school sports um, and, uh, and doing really good things. So learned an awful lot, and, uh, but yeah, excited for, for what's next too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, to your comment about you know, nobody with entrepreneurs that they don't really know what they're doing, but you have to you know, put up this facade that you do. I mean, you're, you're trying to get people to buy into your idea. You're pitching to investors. You're, you know, to potential partners, to potential, you know, employees, and always having to put on like this this persona of this person that really knows, um, you know, knows what they're doing. Where you know maybe inside that's not that's not really the case. Um, I mean, had, was that an experience for you? Yeah. Um... Yeah, and it, I didn't realize that it was an experience until much later, probably more recently. Um, at the time, it was just how you play the game, and I was pretty good at playing the game. So I'd, you know, be who I had to be in the situation to produce the result, right? Um, if I had to be gregarious, I could do that. If I had to be sort of deferential, I could do that. It, you know, I could, I could toggle um, fairly well. And in hindsight, like it definitely is is effective, and I think there's a certain level of expectation in particularly the the VC backed startup world that um, you know the leader has the answers and is kind of driving from the front. Um, you try to go to a venture capitalist and say, "Well, I don't know about this, and I don't know about this, and I'm not sure here, and it's not going to work very well." Right. So that approach is expected. Yeah. It. It also, in my case, uh, I can speak from experience, it certainly uh, caused me to, you know, get so far into that persona that I, I kind of lost touch with, you know, what I'd been interested in way back in the day and the reasons that I first started the business um, and what, you know, what got me interested in entrepreneurship and creation in the beginning. And so I think there's a, uh, there's a risk um, that, you know, you can have a, a persona is a great word for it that's so polished and so perfect that you're um, to anybody else, you're invulnerable and invincible. Mm -hmm. And it creates this wall between you and other people that oftentimes can prevent people from, that could help you from actually being able to help you because you don't need help, right? Yeah, you're not, you're trying so hard not to be vulnerable, but it must be very, very, very stressful to be in that situation because you probably, like you said, you, you could use some help and advice and support. Now you, you have this reputation to live up to. And I'm sure that, that that's very taxing. And I'm sure you're not the only yeah. entrepreneur or even leader that has to go through this because when 
people look up to you or they're looking to you or you have to prove something, you know, puts you in, in that position. Well, I was, yeah, I mean, I think if you're in, if you're in a public position, that's very true. Um, I was just watching The Last Dance, that Michael Jordan documentary, and, you know, he's, he's a great example. He was this figure that stopped really being human at some point, and he had to live into that for forever, and that's, that's a lot for people. Yeah. But I think in, in, in running a company, um, part of the maturation that I went through uh, as a leader is I think having a little more trust and faith in people to be able to handle some of the ambiguity and handle more of the vulnerability than I originally thought that they could. So as an example, um, one of the the primary things that you manage as a, a CEO of a venture back startup is runway, which is the amount of time you have between when now and when you run out of money and everybody loses their job. So that can be a really stressful thing to manage, particularly if that number is small. Mm -hmm. um, I got it, you know, it was at, at this low point, it was down to about seven days I had of runway with 50 or 60 people that I'm, or 50 or 60 families that I'm supporting. Um, and we pulled it out, we we always pulled it out, but that's stressful as hell, right? And I, for a long time, thought that my job was to protect the team from that and not you know, just you guys do your job. I don't want to distract you. This is my burden to bear. Wow. And, and over time I learned, you know, kind of through experience that it, it, um, it actually works better to be more open and more transparent around even the uncertain and scary stuff with your team and with everybody else around you. Um, because it allow a, it allows them to help, but B the thing that, that I ran into is that, because runway was short, I was making decisions based on that short-term um, timeline that we had. And the team's like, well, why aren't we thinking longer term? This doesn't make sense because they were missing that critical bit of information that, well, this is the only time that we have. So having that context and being able to share not just the stuff that, you know, makes everybody like warm and fuzzy and excited, but everything, including the nasty and the hard stuff, because that's there. Um, I think allows you know you as a leader to br to to bring a team together, and then uh, and then have them kind of you know follow you wherever it is that uh, that you're going. So that was a, a learning for me over time. Did you eventually get to that point? Yep. Okay. Yep. But it yeah it's it, uh, I mean I I probably uh, learned by failure more than more than most. So I had to try it one way until that stopped working, and then once that stopped working, I I, I learned. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, th I think that, you know, it's a unique perspective that a lot of um, aspiring or, or new entrepreneurs aren't hearing mm -hmm. or, you know, aren't expecting. And, um, yeah, I think it's an important aspect of it because really that you do have to learn from your mistakes and, um, and your own failures, I think, to a certain extent. But really balancing that drive and determination and, you know, keeping everybody positive with, you know, also being transparent enough. So you're not carrying that burden all on your own. And people, you know, I, I think would be an important aspect of culture in a company you know, from the beginning. I, yeah. Yeah. I think, think from the beginning is right. I think it's, it's really easy um, in the startup world and the startup culture sort of in the macro sense to think that everybody's crushing it and everybody's doing amazing stuff and it's all up and to the right and you're the only one that has problems um, because nobody else talks about their problems, right? And, but the reality is that my experience is as I've been open, you know, once I learned those lessons and as I started to just be open with the warts and all, I found that everybody else was willing to be as well and, uh, and it led to some really um, pretty impactful uh, conversations and relationships which started with everybody, you know, chest puffing like how awesome we are. And then I came out and I'd say like, hey, actually this part's really hard and I'm struggling with it. Um, you don't need to solve my problem, but like this just sucks right now. Yeah. And that opens up uh, a space. And oftentimes what happens is other people step into that and you know, you get to build some pretty cool friendships that way. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it, um, you know, it's important for everyone to feel comfortable enough to, you know, take that mask off, you know, that facade and just be like really supportive of each other. And then just the overall mission, you know, of the company. Yeah. And knowing, you know, 
being part of the whole thing instead of just being spoon fed, you know, what, what your role is or whatever like that. Well, yeah. It gives people a chance to, to really invest and like, like contribute themselves as opposed to just do a job. So, I mean, I think it, it's got a whole lot of stuff going for it. It just took me a while to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's a great insight. So, yeah. um, you know, through, through that whole experience, do you think that was your biggest uh, takeaway or is there anything else that, that you think you learned in that experience? You know, I mean, I, I, I owe my whole business acumen to this experience. Like this has been, you know, by and large my business career. So I feel like I've learned so much about business, about leadership, about life through running a company. Um, I'm remembering a quote that uh, somebody said that starting a business is a leadership generating machine disguised as, you know, an economic engine. I think that's true. I think uh, it, you know, you learn so quickly just based on how difficult some of the challenges are that you're, you're put into uh, about yourself and about how business works and, um, and how you react to tough situations. So yeah, I, I, I've learned a ton. I think um, one thing that comes to mind in particular is um, I think I've learned about myself that uh, the sort of the power of persistence and resilience. Um, I don't think that I, I have any particular skills. Um, you know, I had a chance to think about like, well, what do I, now that I'm, I've left VNN, it's like, well, what do I want to do? What skills do I have and how do I want to apply them? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't really think I have any particular skill. Um, but what I have is is like a dogged ability to keep going regardless of anything. Um, and I think in, in VNN's case, that, you know, the willingness to get up the next day and keep going even when logically it you should pack it in and it doesn't make sense to keep going, um, uh, it made the difference for VNN. We went through three or four times where you know, if I was just trying to make a smart decision, I would have packed it in, but it wasn't about that. It was about, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to, I'm going to, um, you know, come hell or high water. And so I think like at some point that, that drive and determination, um, kind of makes up for any lack of talent that, uh, you may or may not come in with. Um, and, uh, and I think that's probably the, the most impactful thing I learned about myself through the journey. Yeah, for sure. And that's not a skill set you're going to learn in college. You know, like right. you said, you've got to go through it, but you have to have the, you know, I guess the innate um, skills that you were born with to really, you know, well, veer through that. I don't know. I mean, I think it's learned. I think, um, you know, in my case, I learned it because I quit the basketball team when I was a senior in high school after dedicating my whole life to basketball for. 12 years or however long it was. I was gonna play college ball and the whole thing. And um, I got in a fight with the coach and because I was a impetuous little kid, I decided to quit the team. And I was like, I'm out. And that was so like traumatic for me. Um, and it, it really just sent me down a really rough spot for a while because of how basketball, how important that was to me and then how just flippantly I, I got rid of it. Um, I think that experience is the reason that I've stuck through any number of other things is because I know what it's like to quit something too early. Um, and I'm committed to not doing that. And so I think like, you know, you have experiences throughout life. A lot of them are the really hard ones that really hurt at the time. But I think that that resilience is something like a lot of things that can be learned. Yeah. Um, but it only comes with pain. Yeah, that's great. So now you are no longer with VNM, and uh, I know that you've really taken, um, you know, some of these insights that you've discovered about yourself to heart and onto a, a next interesting endeavor where you have um, a blog that you talk about meditation, leadership, entrepreneurship, and you've also started um, some meditation groups with leaders and entrepreneurs, which I'm excited to be part of one of them. So can you? Um, just take us through that, that journey of how you, how yeah. you got where you are now. Yeah, well, so I've been meditating for um, 10 years or so. Uh, and for the first, I'd say eight, it was, you know, using a combination of headspace and um, 
Calm and Insight Timer and these apps that, you know, it's kind of like the Americanized 10 minutes a day and you're going to be calm and, you know, collected and be great. So that was, I just did that for a long, a long time. And because I don't quit stuff, I just kept at it for eight years. Um, as luck would have it and sort of as life evolved, I started to take a, a, a much more active role and, and um, I started to spend more time in uh, my meditative practice over the last couple of years. And I've had the chance to study under some, some, you know, quote unquote masters and travel and stayed at a monastery for a while and have learned a whole bunch about um, brain science, uh, first person science, a lot of people call it. Um, and it's been truly just life transforming for me um, to, to be able to look critically at how I make the decisions that I make and um, intentionally kind of rewire those things rather than just assuming that, oh, I just am who I am and you know the results I get are the results I get. So that process has been so, um, so awesome for me. And one of the, the sort of key turning points um, that meditation certainly played a role in, in driving me toward uh, was an insight that, you know, for a long time, probably the first 10 years of my career, I was mostly interested in success for success's sake. Just, I just wanted to win. You know, I wanted to build the biggest, coolest thing. And um, it was a pretty egoic endeavor. Was, I just wanted people to like, be like, yeah, dude, that's a sweet company. Um, and, and at some point, with a lot of sort of radical self-inquiry through meditation and, and uh, other things, it became really clear that I didn't care about that anymore. Um, and that the reasons that I had worked my ass off and, and sacrificed so much uh, to build DNN just didn't, uh, just didn't care. Um, and it was a pretty, at first it was really disruptive and I like tried to fake it. I was like, I, I gotta continue to care because come on, this is just a funk or something. Uh, but, but it, it, uh, you know, it didn't go away. And, uh, as I dug into it and spent more time with it, it became clear that what I wanted to do was less about like building something cool and more about like helping with what needs to be done, um, for the world, for people, you know, I think that can take a, a variety of forms, but, um, so that was a that was a sort of a big turning point for me, and uh, has definitely played a role in in my sort of veer left, you know, uh, uh, toward the next thing that I I'll, I'll do. Um, so I'm not actively doing like there's no business that I'm working on right now, but I do uh, I did start a a meditation group for leaders. I say you know there's nothing I'm working on because that's not a business. That's just a sort of a project that I'm working on. Um, but it started as a, a means of bringing that sort of radical self inquiry to the business community. Um, because I had for so long just had conversations with business people that just sounded like I'm crushing it. You're crushing it. We're all great. Isn't this awesome? And then we'd leave. And it just is so silly to me uh, at this point. I don't want to do those conversations. And so if you kind of get people to look inward, um, it opens up some real sort of authentic human conversations amongst business people, which to me seems like, you know, a, a really high leverage conversation to have given the influence that business has on our culture. So I was like, well, I'll create a group for like 10 of my friends, 10 uh, business owners, and we'll meditate together and I'll, I'll kind of uh, walk them through that process. And that was all it was supposed to be. But um, within like three weeks, people started telling people and people started telling other people. And now like a month and a half later, uh, I'm now running five uh, uh, meditation groups for leaders. Um, we're calling it The Quieting for now. That's the, that's the working title. But there's five of them. There's probably going to be a sixth next week. Um, and I'm just there's been no marketing and no really anything. It's just people calling me up and saying, Hey, I hear you're doing, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're helping meditation in the business context um, or in the professional context. Uh, I'd like to learn more. So for me, it's just been so cool to watch um, this, you know, popcorn fart of an idea that I had at one point kind of grow and morph. And, um, and it's been really fun for me to sort of shepherd that along. And I have no idea what it'll be. But uh, at this point, you know, I feel like the work itself, um, starting that conversation in the business context and helping people to get 
um, you know, more in touch with, with themselves and what they really want, what they really value uh, is worthwhile in its own right. So if it becomes something fantastic, if it doesn't fantastic, I'm still glad that, uh, you know, it's a conversation I get to be a part of. Yeah. Well, this, you know, this just takes us full circle to what we were speaking about a little while ago about, you know, the facade, you know, and the persona that you put on or, you know, even, you know, I know for myself, sometimes I could just literally live in my head. Mm -hmm. you know, I just can't get out of this, you know, constant chatter and thoughts and, you know, feeling like I should be working on a million different things. And, you know, I've definitely been um, exploring meditation for a while over, you know, the last five, 10 years, but it's been hard for me to keep in a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I think when you need it most, it's the hardest to do because you think you should be doing something else. And especially for, I think, entrepreneurs and leaders are so driven sometimes that they just might not even accept that that is something that they should spend their time doing. But I think, you know, the group that you're putting together, I know for me, it's been great to, to have that, you know, that accountability and getting into that framework and rhythm again, but also, you know, exploring some of these ideas with other, other business people, other really you know, driven, success orientated type individuals to, mm -hmm. to really be able to, you know, take that facade off and talk, you know, get a bit deeper about what's really going on. So it, it's been a great experience for me. I'm so glad. I think there's, um, there's a particular uh, mental makeup of a lot of sort of American, you know, go, go, go culture that uh, startup founders are, are, the tip of the spear in this and, and that's very much me um where it's sort of a bias toward action and you know we'll figure it out along the way but i just have to go i have to work i have to you know there's no stopping mm -hmm. we don't slow down very well in uh in this culture although maybe with covid where some of us are being forced to um but that has a that mental makeup has has a lot of benefits it also has one big cost um, which is it, it leads to sort of reactive decision making in a lot of ways because you're so biased toward, you know, whack-a-mole, like get this thing done, whatever it is, you're just, you're just going. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes in my case, like I've made stupid decisions just because I hurried, right? And I was just so content on getting, the, like checking the box um, that if I would have just taken a half a breath, I probably would have thought through uh, more and, and, and made a better decision. So meditation is a practice of sitting, among other things, of sitting with urges that you have, physical and mental, you know, thoughts and, and emotions and urges. Um, in my case, and a lot of startup founders' case, that's like the urge to be productive, the urge to go and you know, check this box. With meditation, you have the opportunity to practice feeling that urge without actually acting on it. And so over time. You, get, you begin to develop the ability to sort of have a space between when you're triggered with somebody saying, hey, you've got to get this shit done, and when you actually respond and you, you get to um, respond instead of react, which, I mean, that differentiation just between those two things can be, can drastically change the outcome of your business and your life, so. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that completely. So for somebody that's not, that is not really, have any experience with meditation, but would like to explore it. Where do you, where would you suggest they begin with that? Well, they're welcome uh, to, to contact me and uh, we can talk about putting them in a group. I think um, there's no expectation of experience for the groups that we put together. A lot of times it's uh, some, sometimes it's people with no experience at all. Sometimes it's people with uh, a dedicated practice and they're spending, you know, consistent time on it. But I'd say more often than anything else, the the framework that people enter in from is like, yeah, I've tried it. I've tried one of the apps or somehow or another I've gone on YouTube and I'd like to like have the result, but I just haven't been able to get it done. I haven't been able to dedicate the time or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's like the same reasons that I don't exercise regularly are the reasons that I haven't been able to make this work. Um, that particular, like in, in any of these cases, you know, people are welcome to, to come work with us. And I think we've found that with that sort of team-based setting, um, it increases the, the likelihood that you'll do it and you'll, you'll get something out of it. Mm -hmm. 
but particularly for those people that have an interest and um, you know and uh, and have tried but just it hasn't turned into a regular thing I think that that uh, adding the team dynamic can be a, a, a huge benefit to that yeah um, but if if they're not interested in joining a group there's calm there's headspace there's waking up which is an app that I really like by Sam Harris um, and then there's innumerable books on the topic of the 10,000 different types of meditation that you can yeah. you can try. Yeah, I know there are so many. You really do have to kind of experiment to find the one that's best you know, yeah. for yourself. But I, I think, you know, having that group dynamic, not only for, you know, the structure and accountability, but quite often, you know, especially as a beginner, you're meditating and you're like, I'm doing this wrong. I suck at this. You know, yeah. Forget it. Especially yeah. for somebody that's like doesn't want to waste their time on things that don't make a difference in their lives. So this kind of, you know, having those discussions and realizing it, it is truly a practice and yeah, nobody's going to get it, you know, right away. Well, I think um, one of the, one of the challenges that for people that are just starting meditating is that is the thoughts like that, like, ah, I'm not doing this right, or this isn't working or whatever. Um, and you know you, that's a great reason to stop sometimes if you just listen to those thoughts, right? But um, meditation doesn't change your thoughts; it just shows you them. And so, like the reality is that if like if those are the thoughts that you're you're thinking during meditation, those are the same thoughts that you're thinking during the rest of your life too, in various you know contexts. And it's useful yeah. to think about what that does for you in other areas. So. Um, yeah, like meditation shows you uh, how your mind works. It doesn't change it. You need to do that work on your own. Um, but I think like sometimes it's easier for people when they see like, oh, this is not a helpful, you know, mind frame that I'm, I'm getting into. It's easier just to like ignore it and and kind of put it back into the background and not deal with it. But yeah. that has, I think that you leave a lot of value on the table if that's how you approach it. Yeah, for sure. Well, this has been a great conversation, Ryan. There's so many things I could talk to you about, but I'm glad um, it went in this direction because I think it, I think it's um, unique and insightful, you know, for people to to think about these things. So, how could people learn more about you? Yeah. Um, so my website is ryanhvaughn.com, um, and that's you know it's a, a, a blog at this stage, um, and then. Uh, the groups are called the quieting, um, and as it evolves, that title may or may not continue, but that's what it is for now. And uh, and anybody, that wants like to, yeah, anybody that wants to get in touch can reach me at ryan. H. Vaughn at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah.